I am Ayan Sandarkar from IIT Bombay, Department of Electrical Engineering. My interest area is VLSI design. We have a around 40 hour course in this area of advanced VLSI design. Uh, I will be assisted with uh, or rather I will be coordinating a pro, uh, this kind of course with three other faculty. The details about the course content and the faculty and what they will teach I will speak about in the, my next talk. Today I will start to try to talk with you something about historical perspective and future trends in CMOS VLSI circuits and system design. Let us start with the very early 20th century. Uh, there are many inventions in 20th century like airplane, nuclear power generation, computers, space aircraft and things of that kind. However, everything has to be controlled by electronics as is now known. So, many people ask what is exactly is electronics? So, electronics I must say it is the most important uh, invention of 20th century and it essentially means the flow of electrons in a circuit and therefore, these circuits were called electronic circuits. The modified version or the integrated version of same circuit is called integrated circuits and the, this course is essentially talking about very large scale integrated circuit design. Without an IC, uh, the present things like mobile phone cannot be made. Just to give a, just to take you even before uh, 50 years before what we were. Say for example, world of 1958, uh, we are the first artificial satellite Sputnik, which was uh, injected by Russian, ejected by Russian in 1957. Uh, we started with radio and today we are at TV. You can see from here, initially we started with vacuum tubes. Uh, even t televisions were vacuum tube as late as 2000 year. Now, only we have LCD LED displays. Earlier, we have all vacuum tube based TVs. Uh, the first solid state transistor actually appeared in 1955 and the credit goes to Sony. So, as I said, electronics is the most important invention in 20th century. Electronics are integrated circuits, what how they actually have progressed in last 100 years. We started with vacuum tube and today we are at very large scale integrated circuits. Just to tell you, 6 years ago it was the 100 year anniversary of a vacuum tube. The first vacuum tube were made by Lee Forest and it looked like something like this. And uh, today when we are talking of a VLSI, this is a SRAM uh, which we are showing you. Uh, this is a 64 K SRAM from Intel and uh, you can see the change in the structure, change in the operation of a single vacuum tube compared to what today we call uh, memory semiconductor memories. The first computer which appeared in the uh, scenario of 2000, which was, uh, it was even before 2000 was credited to Babbage. This is called difference engine which was proposed by Babbage in 1832 and it has 25,000 mechanical parts and in those days it cost something like 17,470 pounds. Uh, in today's money, it may be millions and millions of dollars equivalently or maybe crores of rupees in Indian money. So, this kind of a mechanical system was first thought, uh, which uh, later on became registrex or some kind of register system. And please remember, the first register system was used or rather popul popularized by the most famous company in computer, the IBM. Actually, they also had their first machine, which was mostly mechanical system. The first electronic computer came uh, in 1946 was named as ENIAC. Essentially, it was electronic calculator, some kind of equivalent, but it was made out of vacuum tubes. Uh, the, you can see this has been uh, put into a garage of a huge building or the basement of a huge building. And it, uh, even it was doing only four small operations, but it requires such a large area, large systems, large in size, it consumes hell of a power and it has a very short time, short life uh, filament available on the tube. So, you have to keep changing the tubes. Let us take a comparison, if for this ENIAC equivalent, if I now make a Pentium 4 in ENIAC equivalent circuit or equivalent system, uh, it will be at least two height of a Empire State Building in New York and will require for to cool it at most two Niagara Falls every minute to throw on it. So, the kind of system from where we started in 46 and the kind of system we are now talking in 2012 is a hell of a difference, large improvements, large uh, 
something which can do many more functions than what we thought in 1946. Please remember in life, uh, whether we talk about circuits, we talk about anything, at the end of the day anything can be done if there is money. After all, economics matters or money matters. So, for you, those who are money minded and uh, maybe one should be uh, these days, uh, let me uh, show you some kind of a view graph which says we are looking for customers who breathe, eat, live only electronic systems. So, as I was talking to you about economics, in case of semiconductor industry, this economics is related to what we say. If you see uh, the lowermost triangle inverted pyramid, the lower part, the semiconductor equipment material requirement is around 100 billion dollars. The semiconductor itself is around 400 billion market dollar market. Electronic equipment is around 1050 billion dollars and overall impact on political microeconomic environments which uses these kind of electronic components and systems have around 50,000 US billion dollars. So, this is the kind of money in which electronics is now involved and therefore, uh, one should not take things very lightly. Uh, why we are progressing so fast? Because somehow we want to see that we do much more profit than what we have been doing today. Many students have asked me over the years uh, that how do you really know this when before you start a particular system on chip that is you want to fabricate a chip, what will be the chip cost of production? So, I have actually taken it as old data 2005 data. Uh, not that it is the current uh, value system, but the idea of evaluation of uh, any product money is shown here. Say for example, 1000 wafers per month, if that is what your company can manufacture, of course, they are large number of parts. 600 dollars are actually required for 6 inch quarter micron wafer, thickness wafer. Uh, so, therefore, it is roughly for the lot you are talking, it is 3.5 dollars per centimeter square is the charge you will require for the silicon. Add for packaging around quarter dollar pin for uh, you know quad kind of flat pack uh, flat package. Uh, this is the most costliest part per pin because it may be 100 pin, 200 pin package. So you know, lot of cost go actually goes per pin on the packaging. Then you add around 200 dollars an hour for 256 pin mixed signal tester, about one second to move sides. Okay, six inch wafer and 180 centimeter square 8 inch, 8 inch uh, which is 1 310 centimeter square is the area typically I am talking. And from this numbers then one can probably evaluate. Uh, please remember I have not added the design cost which at times may be larger than this, but generally it is now found that the cost of chip is actually goes in the testing which is the highest amount of money one spends just to say that my chip is working or working well to the specification. Coming back to what I was talking, I just thought these two slides to show you that why semiconductor industry is doing well or why so much effort is put on the semiconductor industry, why Intel, IBM, HPs are known or Texas instrument is known world across. The simple reason as I said is the amount of money which they are generating or spending on people as well as on systems. So, let us go back to say history how semiconductor device is started way back in 1947 first point contact bipolar transistor in germanium was made and the credit goes to Bardin in Britain and they won Nobel prize. In 48 first junction to actually it was not 48, it 48 it started in 1956 the first bipolar uh, junction transistor and not the point contact transistor was actually first suggested and his group then manufactured or fabricated was due to William Shockley. Uh, there is an interesting story on Shockley as I proceed ahead I will talk about that. He also won same time 1956 Nobel prize was awarded to Shockley, Bardin and Britain for invention of transistor. In 1958 the first integrate circuit was suggested and was actually made by Jack Kilby then he was at the Texas Instruments, uh, he is late Jack Kilby now and he won in 2000 the Nobel prize. The in 59, the first planar IC came and that credit goes to Robert Noyce and uh, is the most famous person in integrated circuit. I will come, come to it when it comes to the next slide. And the major invention of today's this came through the efforts of uh, Kang and Atala Bell Labs and they make first MOS transistor. 
Here are some interesting uh, photographs. Uh, the first point contact transistor shown on your left is uh, is a point contact done by Bardeen and Britton. You will be surprised what they were actually trying on a uh, simple germanium piece, they were putting two uh, probes and trying to feel whether they, it can amplify a signal. So, it was quite trivial when they started, but when they started bonding it, they suddenly realized yes, they got some kind of amplification and that made you know sudden change in thinking of most people that oh simple material with two contacts can actually do amplification, which was vacuum tube required a huge area, huge power 300 volt supply. Contrast to this, it required hardly 5 volt supply and very small current, low power and it was still doing amplification for signals. So, this was an invention of 1947, which made the today's world, whatever we see in most of the integrated circuit area is essentially due to the first such invention by Bardeen and Britton. On your right, you can see there are two, three people sitting. One is Bardin on the left, the right is Bratton, and the lower one is the famous person William Shockley. He was the head of the group, which was supposed to uh, government of uh, United States that time asked them to actually make uh, some kind of replacement for vacuum tube, and he was heading that group. And uh, Shockley went in 1948, 47, 48. He was in uh, Caltech as a visiting faculty and during this time Bardin and Bratton actually invented. So, when the patent was filed by Bell Labs about this uh, point contact transistor, it did not put Shockley's name and Shockley was furious. When he came back, he said this is unfair because uh, most of this discussion which went through before 47 was with me by both Bardin and Bratton and he had a tough fight with Bardin. Bardin then actually you will not believe, but in 1951 Bardin left the group and actually started working on some other area which is called superconductivity and he won his second Nobel prize in 1959. Okay. So, Bardeen was the very most furious person that uh, Shockley wants all credit, but uh, Bell Lab did not file a patent along with Shockley. So, Shockley started working on germanium junction transistor instead of point contact and in 1954 he first time actually showed how a junction transistor can work. And for this uh, invention of his along with Bardin and Breton, all three were awarded the Nobel Prize. There are interesting histories about Shockley. Please go through some Wikipedia uh, kind of things to know how Shockley really behaved in his life. All said and done, this is slightly magnified version of uh, the same transistor point contact germanium transistor, which was made in 1950 for display. This, is a, this photograph is actually taken from Bell Labs Museum where this transistor is still actually shown. In 58, you know the another young uh, engineer then Jack Kilby joined Texas Instrument and uh, the way he was, he was actually asked to help people in making some CRT tubes kind of base circuits and he had much more time to uh, while away. So, he was in sitting al alone, he used to find that why uh, you know only transistors have been put separately, then you put on a board something a resistor this, why not I can make all components in silicon or in a one same material. And then if I join, it will be a universal kind of circuit in which everything is made out of a semiconductor. This idea not only he thought, but he also actually introduced that itself on a board and on the your left, the first integrated circuit as made by Jack Kilby is shown to you. Though it looks uh, far away from today's integrated circuit, but the main important point that this was the first IC which has one resistor, uh, two resistor, one capacitor, one transistor all together on a circuit and that has worked. Uh, the importance is it was working circuit. Please remember Jack Kilby was not assigned this project even after this invention by Texas Instruments. So, that is the irony of life that you are asked to do something for which you think you know more. Okay. However, Jack Kilby's uh, invention was never treated very high till so late as 2000 in which he was then awarded the Nobel Prize. Simultaneously when Jack Kilby was doing something on the kind of things he showed. Robert Noyce, then at Fairchild and then who then invented, uh, then he started company along with others, Intel, they actually were thinking of making uh, all components in silicon and they called p n junction based 
silicon device isolation technique which allowed components to be separated in the silicon. There was another scientist or another engineer Kurt Lehoek who was that time at Spraga Electric and then joined USC as a very distinguished professor at University of Southern California. They, they also worked on p-n junction isolation theory and that allowed us to actually separate components inside a silicon block. Unfortunately, both died before Kilby got the Nobel Prize, probably he would have to share the money as well as the credit if had they been alive in 2000. So, here is the first planar integrated circuit, you can see from here there are three parts annular form one this, one downwards and one center and these are contacts. So, P and P transistor were first made by Robert Noyce inside the silicon itself, all diffusions inside all contacts on the top and this was the major invention I must say which allowed integrated circuit to manufacture in large number of densities and very cheap methods. This so called planar technique still stands and uh, this is the way almost every semiconductor chip is made. Uh, here is the photograph of Robert Noyce who actually also he was also working with there is called eight dirties. Uh, among them is Gordon Moore, Intel's noise, uh, noise, then there used to be Chang. All these were working with a new company in uh, uh, Menlo Park in California under headship of Shockley. But as usual, Shockley never wanted to give credit to any one of them and therefore, they all eight dirties left and started a company Fairchild and this Fairchild was a camera company. They did some work and then they realized that in a camera company their choice they were only making CCDs. So, they left uh, Fairchild and started their own company and then called Intel Corporation. What today you all see is because of probably Shockley because if Shockley would have been a good man probably uh, Intel would never have started. To sum up on this kind of device I have a interesting slide. Uh, you know one of my very famous distinguished colleague at Tokyo Institute of Technology is Professor Hiroshi and this slide actually was made by him. So, I thought I always show to everyone. He said how the device has pro devices technology have progressed over the years. To your left you can see Professor Iwai was a boy of 12 years in 64. However, in 2012 this is how he looks he is 60 year old. And in 2062, another 50 years if you add, he will be 112 years, and I do not know how will he will look. A too long a time for anyone, for him as well as for me. So, what has happened in 64? Transistor just started to be used for radio. Yeah, most people thought amplifiers is all that you need, some small logic was made. And the history shows that this part was, though always novel but was not very difficult. It was rather easier to actually achieve successes faster. Slowly when you say uh, every system became based on integrated circuits, particularly silicon integrated circuits. Over the years last uh, you can see 2000 onwards 12 now onwards till 2062 any progress in silicon IC industry or in silicon in, uh, technology will be very very difficult. So, for us it was a nice time we could do small things and get credit for it probably in future when you start doing work in this area you will find very difficult to progress as the pace with which we all progressed or the technology progressed. So, in nutshell in 1900 diode came the 1906 triode came Wilson's uh, invention. In two, uh, 1926, MISFET and MOSFET were first announced, never made, but announced. First bipolar transistor came in 47 to 50, uh, both Bard and Bratton and Shockley's uh, inventions. First IC came in 58, Kilby, Noyce and uh, Leovic. First MOSFET appeared in 1960 by Kang and Atala. And first large scale integrated circuit uh, appeared in 1970. Uh, the names were given because we started looking for the number of components on chip. So, first we started with vacuum tube, first 20 years it took us to reach to transistor concept, next 30 years we could make ICs and last 10 years up to 70 we were spending on large scale integration and I do not know next last 30, 40 years we are in the era of VLSI or ultra large scales. 
what was the difference from 1900 to 2000 otherwise in this performance wise the first electronic circuit was huge power and very slow a huge power consuming and comparatively low speeds lower speeds we wanted to look for lower power dissipation so we went from vacuum tubes to solid state now silicon technology allowed high integration and when we went to cmos we have a low power, high speed, very high integration devices put on a single chip and uh, the, we are still continuing for high integration, very high speed and low power. They remain the same parameters in which integrated circuits are being advancing now. Please remember that in 1925 to 33 twice there was a research done on MOSFET including Shockley was actually working on MOSFET and Shockley has a file. Uh, legal fight with many people saying that MOSFET was his concept. Unfortunately, Bell Lab did not file a patent on the name of Shockley, otherwise probably this would not have happened. Shockley of course, always had a brighter idea than most people of his time. So, nothing that he could not think. Uh, because of very bad interface property then between semiconductor and the gate insulator, MOSFET could not be realized till 1960. And the word I always say, even Shockley could not make, in spite of all the intelligence he thinks he had. The first MOSFET as a concept was uh, given by 19 uh, by a Air Force officer of uh, Royal Air Force of England or Britain. Uh, he actually filed his first patent. The name is Lillenfield. Okay, uh, he has a U.S. patent uh, on a MOS. Uh, surfaces and MOS devices. The MOS transistor was suggested by him. He had a aluminum oxide as insulator, aluminum as a back contact, so is aluminum the top contact. And he did actually suggest that this may amplify as far as his theory goes. But actually this was not his original, uh, this idea was not so original because by the same time a German scientist Oscar Hill also was working on MOS and has actually has patented independent of uh, Lillenfeld in 1934. He had another patent on MOSFET, but that was a European patent. So, no one knew that uh, Lillenfeld has a uh, US patent. So, there was a fight between Heil and this, but uh, all said the fight could not last because no device could be made. Uh, what I meant by interface properties can be seen from here between C germanium and germanium oxide, if this is your insulator, the because they are two different materials, they all silicon to uh, germanium to germanium oxide bonds are not satisfied and therefore, there are some charges left which are called dangling bonds charges which are called interfacial charges. And uh, the net effect was they were shielding the effect of voltage on the gate material and not every voltage could be then put into induced into the semiconductor. And then there was another problem people could immediately think that if the carriers have to move, they should move fast. But there were a lot of scattering, what we call carrier carrier scattering uh, and also field scattering, which allowed very small amount of current to flow. So, it was found when the first MOSFET was made, drain current which was uh, measured by then was several orders smaller than what was theory was expecting. And as I keep saying, this was even Shockley could not explain then. Though latter time when suggested that the surface states have become interface states, the states were actually explained by Shockley and therefore, they were also called Shockley states. By 1960, the first MOSFET actually was made at Bell Labs and the two people Kang and Atala, this lady is not Atala by the way, he is Mrs. Kang, they actually made the first MOS transistor and uh, they made it out of silicon instead of uh, germanium and they have SiO2 as the interface uh, as the insulator and the interface between Si and SiO2 was far superior than germanium germanium oxide. There was very little shielding between insulator and gate and because of that the first MOS transistor worked. Uh, a figure could be shown here. This was the source area, this was the drain area and in between this was the gate and that was covered by aluminum. So, this was a first MOSFET which appeared in 1960. Then we changed from metal gate to polysilicon gate to reduce the capacitances 
and uh, we still kept on having SiO2 and silicon substrate for almost till 2000 or even today many Intel circuits or IBM circuits still have SiO2 as the insulator. They have changed modified SiO2 with something else, but silicon dioxide is still going strong. But in 2010 probably or 2005 onwards, we have shifted out of uh, SiO2 and new high K dielectrics are coming. So, typically using a gate field effect, one can see from here the gate could then control the carriers below by the induction Gauss's law and then connect between source and drain and large current could flow. This was the first MOS transistor way it was made successfully. Two types of MOSFETs were made, one due to N type MOSFET which was in which the electron motion was possible because the if you apply a positive uh, voltage on the gate, the negative charges are induced and between N silicon source and N silicon drain electron channel could be created. We start with the P substrate therefore, it is called inversion layer electrons could move under the electric field in laterally and constitute a current. So, we say N type because the carriers were electrons whereas, in the case of P channel we started with N substrate we have a negative voltage on the gate to actually create inversion layer of holes between P silicon source to P silicon drain holes can move and therefore, hole motion was also possible and we therefore, declared it as P type MOSFETs. Uh, you will be wondering that I am talking about advanced VLSI course and why this because the first course which I gave was a web course in which all this was not actually provided. So, I thought if you are reading VLSI design 1 and VLSI design 2 in continuation, let us at least come back and show what things happened over the years. Yeah, this is something same. Uh, since we are looking for a MOSFET as a switch, we found out it is much easier to actually say how it off and on. So, we said okay, if you apply 0 volt on the gate, let us say you are n channel MOSFET going. So, you require positive V g to uh, create an inversion. So, if you apply less than that particular voltage we call threshold voltage, right now we put 0 voltage which is less than positive V t then there is no channel between source and drain. So, therefore, there is no current between source and drain. So, we say off state no drain current. Of course, there is a leakage current, but that is very small and we still declared as a off state. On the contrary, if we apply a gate voltage which is larger than threshold on the gate, an inversion channel can be created of electrons source drain if I apply voltage across this is like a Ohm's law, this is a resistor you are applying two contacts and the drift current can flow and we call that as on state or 1 for the transistor. So, on and off 0 and 1 could be created out of MOS switching and therefore, it became the most important candidate for switching circuits or logic circuit. Over the years I again now summarize quickly the years through which we went through in technology first MOSFET transistor Linenfeld and Heil in 35-25. CMOS 1960, but plagued with manufacturing problems. Please remember the first CMOS was attempted as early as 1960. It was not only PMOS, it actually they tried both NMOS and PMOS together. NMOS could never be turned on because it was always on. So, we just could not create a CMOS circuit out of it. It was depletion mode was always created. PMOS was then we continue to work with PMOS devices till late 70s most calculators available then was PMOS based circuits 1960 to 1970. Then NMOS technology was improved and then we shifted from PMOS to NMOS because N channel has larger mobility because of electrons. So, more current and lower voltages and therefore, NMOS replaced PMOS individual case uh, for improvement in speed. First Intel processor 4004 and 8080 were made in NMOS early 75. In 1980, when uh, both PMOS and MOS technology were well controlled, the first uh, combined device was made complementary MOS which has both P channel and N channel together. And this has a much more advantage because it sh actually shows much lower power uh, consumption or much lower power dissipation compared to either N MOS which is the more power consuming device than N MOS PMOS, but both were power consuming device compared to when the CMOS is used. 
then we went from CMOS to other technologies like uh, bi CMOS. Uh, we always thought that bipolar circuits were very fast compared to CMOS for many years. The obvious reason was there was huge current in a bipolar transistor and a capacitor can be charged much faster. Therefore, speed of a bipolar circuit is always larger at least till some years, but it was found that the power is also very large to create that high speeds and our ultimate aim for all MOSFET improvements were larger speed at low power. So, people thought if we merge bi bi bipolar technology with CMOS, we may get advantages of both. Unfortunately, it did not happen as well, it actually got disadvantages of both in a larger number than the advantages and except for very specific circuits, some input circuit where TTL inputs are to be given, by CMOS did not actually capture the imagination of most of the designers or most of the system designers. We also shifted to high mobility mat uh, materials like gallium arsenide. We thought that silicon has limited uh, electron mobility compared to any other material. Then we say okay, look for higher mobility materials. We went through gallium arsenide, silicon germanium uh, and even host of silicon nitride is being tried, silicon carbide has been tried. Unfortunately, none of them have as good an interface with insulator as is silicon and therefore, silicon continued to remain as the benchmark material for all integrated circuit technology. Though I will show you at the end maybe if time permitting beyond move is silicon going to stay, yeah possibly. We also worked on SOI uh, silicon on insulators. We are also working on uh, interconnect different interconnects like copper, low K these are the new inventions in last 10 years. Uh, aluminum was replaced by copper, it is a very interesting uh, technology thinking that if copper is known good better conductor both electricity wise as well as by thermally, why at all we started with aluminum, why not copper. Unfortunately, copper for many years even now is called poison to silicon device because it actually creates the levels in the band gap of silicon which actually reduces the lifetime. So, copper was not never allowed probably if you come even to a lab like ours in 1985 which we made in IIT Bombay, we had no copper lining uh, copper tubing anywhere inside the lab because we were told that any MOS or bipolar circuit will not work if you have a copper tubing of gas also coming. So, no question of putting directly on silicon. However, I, there was a damsine process came from the efforts of Texas Instrument, IBM. I think everyone claimed, I do not know who should be given credit. They actually replaced copper and to protect copper from silicon, they had some kind of a cladding around which was titanium nitride. And using this, they could then make an interconnect of copper which has a higher conductivity and therefore, lower resistance and therefore, higher speeds. We also wanted to put more than one layer of metal interconnects. So, between the two metal interconnect lines, we put low capacity, uh, low dielectric constant materials, insulators like uh, many of them HFC and many others were tried. Glass of course, is the only one available earlier. We will try to see whether lower K materials can be used. Air of course, is the best, but you cannot put two metal lines separated by air. So, one has to find some material which can give physical support. 1970-71, the first generation of LSI appeared. This is Intel's 1103D RAM. You can see what kind of structure it has, what kind of how it looks. The first microprocessor, in, as I said earlier, is Intel 404, 404.04. And uh, just for our Indian students, I may say, India's only semiconductor manufacturing company, which was semiconductor complex at Chandigarh somehow purchase the know how to manufacture 4004, God knows why. Okay. I do not want to say more than that. Okay. So, repeat performance what I said so far 1960 integrated circuit came. So, people started thinking how do we name improvement in number of transistors or technology. So, they say okay, first one when we have appeared it has only 10 transistor maximum. So, we call integrated circuits IC. Then we say, oh, if you have more than 1000 kind of transistors, we say it is a large scale integration. In between, there is a uh, small scale, medium scale integration. Then we say 1980, when we say we are larger than 10,000 transistors, we started talking of very large scale integrated circuits. 
by 90s this became some kind of a 10, 1 million transistors. Then we say ultra large scale, but uh, in if it is one than more than a billion now as they are coming up, uh, probably we may call it I do not know what a giant large scale or whatever it is giant scale. But so happened the designers did not like these technology names. So, they kept on calling anything beyond VLSI as VLSI and therefore, it stuck. So, even if now you have a billion transistor on chip, uh, it will still call a VLSI chip whereas, technology people would not like it to call VLSI because for them VLSI means around 10,000 transistors alone. So, what is integration? I just come back again. You say okay, there are multiple devices on one substrate and uh, this question as I say is always asked how large is very large. Okay. So, we say okay, small scale integration chips I would give numbers. TTL has 74,000 series or 7400 series which typically has 10 to 100 transistors. Then you have 74,000 series from TTL which has around 100 transistor plus and uh, we say okay, this is a medium scale. And when we actually moved away from silic, uh, bipolars and we went for large scale 1000 to 10,000 transistors, uh, we actually started calling large scale and above 10,000 as I said, uh, we all started calling VLSI. So, even if now you have million transistors or billion transistors, everything we say is very large scale. If, if I do a course in VLSI design and if I do not utter a word or utter a name, Gordon Moore probably I will be fooling myself. This is he is our so called demigod for VL integrated circuits, VLSI integrated circuits. Gordon Moore was one of those who joined, who left Shockley's company in Monte, uh, this, this and then he joined along with Noyes and others at Fairchild and then started Intel with them. He was a very, uh, I must say he must, he was a very visionary person. When the technology was being grown at Intel, and earlier at Fairchild, he figured out the way technology is improving. On the same die, because of the improvement, I can see that components will doubling. So, first he thought it may double every 18, 14, 14 to 18 months, but later on he said it may double every, uh, every year, he said it will double the component. A log scale, you can say it will start doubling or essentially you can equivalently say exponentially with time, the number of components will double on chip. It was certainly I must say, it was amazing visionary pronouncements and uh, you can see 1980 itself according to what Moore thought, you should have million transistor on the chip and yeah, we did cross that barrier in 1980. So, uh, as if uh, there is a joke going on in uh, both technology group and design group that all of them are working to see that Moore is correct as if. So, we work strive very hard both technologically as well as design ways, so that the Moore's law still is agreed to by almost everyone. Even if we do not reach what Moore thought then, we say okay, deviation from Moore's law, but we kept on talking of Moore's law all through our careers and maybe you will also keep talking in your whole career till you work in the area of integrated circuits. Just to give some numbers of uh, transistors, the first Intel 4004 was 2300 transistors, which was working at 1 megahertz clock. Ultra Spark from Sun, which has 16 million transistors. Uh, 2 gigahertz Intel P4, which appeared in 2001, has 42 million transistors. And in 2003, HP's first uh, PA system 8500 appeared, which has 140 million transistors. Currently, many of the processors, quad ones or ethylion or others from AMD, all have more than more than 400 million transistor on chip. So here is the Moore's law. Okay. So what essentially Moore's law has, as already said, uh, on your right right of the scale, these are the number of transistors. This is a billion number, as I show. This is oh, sorry, this is billion. This is 10 billion. Okay. So uh, you can see the face of Gordon Moore. Uh, I am happy to show you that yeah, I have met him in one of the conference in US. Of course, met many flittingly. I do not think he knows me or I know him. But uh, it is a great uh, thing to know who is this so called Gordon Moore. Okay. So, from 1970 till 2010, all the processors, if you see, 
are actually as per the number of transistor count as modern Moore suggested and they kept on following the years. Of course, it is not 100 percent straight line linear everywhere, a little bit slope change here, but again it has started rising in a similar old fashion and therefore, one can say Moore's law is back in full force. Uh, for example, dual coal Intel Itanium 2 processor which was announced in 2008, okay, it has more than a billion transistors. So, Moore's law essentially was telling that the component density or transistor density will double every year was followed till very, very late. This is something two components shown on the same base, one is uh, memories, the other is microprocessor. Uh, why, I cho why people chose this? Because an integrated circuit or VLSI, uh, if someone asks you the marker, what decides the technology node or what decides the progress? the two devices we always discuss uh, or two such different parameters we look for. One is the improvement in speed and uh, other performance of a microprocessor and the second is memory, how many, how many bits memory you can create in a smaller number and what is the excess time. So, these are two uh, though they are more made out of MOS transistors, but their uh, operation is different from each other. One is purely based on logic, the other is based mostly on the charge or discharge of a capacitor. And because of that, the progress of a MOS technology was always gauged based on the memory as well as microprocessor. So, the Moore's law, if you apply on these two components, uh, microprocessor and this, you can see not exactly one to one correspondence, but yes, by 2010, 4 G 4 G B DRAM is available in the market, which means the Moore's law is still getting followed. Okay. Whereas, we have already reached Itanium, uh, Pentium 4 quads. So, we are already crossing the numbers of transistor which was projected as early as 1970s and uh, we are still going strong with it. Now, question is always asked how long this will last? Uh, well, at the end of this first lecture of mine, well, you may have some idea about where it will end if at all, because if at all is a word I keep using, because there is a statistical theory that there is no zero probability. So, one cannot say nothing will happen, yeah I mean there is a probability may reduce, but may still happen one does not know. Moore figured out that by 2000 that his double uh, every year uh, law is not being followed. So, he projected that uh, it is called Moore's second law. He says, okay, double every two years. First, he said 18 months, then make it 24 months. And now he says, okay, every three years. Okay. So, all that he is now changing the slope, but there is still a law which is being seen as Moore's law, and uh, people are trying to meet what Moore says. So, this is called same, this is a graph between the years as well as the logic uh, number of per chip or logic or gates per chip. And you can see it is slightly separated with the, the same graph Moore's law has been shown separately. This is for memories and this is for processors. One and you know this line is essentially why I, the, this graph has been shown. In the integrated circuit manufacturing, one of the major worry right now is what we call how to print the small dimension. If you reduce the dimension, you have to print something on a silicon wafer of that dimension nanometers say 30 nanometers, 20 nanometers, 10 nanometers. So, when you print something you need a process called lithography transferring image from one to the other. Now, this ha is a limiting point right now we are still using photolithography which is called 193 nanometer process and maybe uh, in 2010 and onwards or 12 onwards uh, we may go, go for what we call extended UV process which is still not been available to any manufacturer. Intel is working, IBM is working, TI is working, but that is not on the manufacturing though it has successfully been tried. So, the limitation now people are saying is not because of the DRAM thinking or this, it may come essentially because of the lithography process may not allow you to go much smaller. But all said and done, if there is a problem, there is a solution and therefore, uh, I do not see why it will not occur. This is same figure again. So, we what I am trying to show you on this, uh, our journey over the years have become micro to nano. Okay. We started with uh, dimensions which were say 100 microns in 1970. I have worked on a chip which was 
uh, a transistor which has a 100 micron channel length in 1976. Of course, by few years we have been to 10 microns, but we start our first MOS transistor in TIFR was just 100 micron length okay. and uh, we made it and it worked. Okay. The importance it worked. Then we of course, went to 10 microns in the next mask. So, in the 60s, we started with 100 some microns and by 90s, end of 90s or even early 2000, uh, we are talking of a million transistor on chip. So, this is what we call really milestones. We went from IC to VLSI to nano now. Okay. So, what essentially in nutshell Moore said, when you say double, he says essentially says that when the size of a feature, smallest feature on the chip reduces. So, he says okay, every uh, technology improvement will be improving it by 0.7 times, it will reduce the number by last 0.7 times and which he now says every 3 years the new modern law is he says 0.7 x. So, for example, if you are working on 90 nanometer technology earlier, so 0.7 of that is 63. So, now then we say okay, next technology will be 65 nanometers. If I multiply it by 0 0.765, it will be around 40 odd number. So, it is called 45 nanometer node. If I multiply by 0 0.745 nanometers, it will become 32 nanometer node. If I multiply by 0 0.7 to 32, it will become 22 nanometers and that is how nodes were actually described. And you can see the behind all this was more multiplied by 0 0.7. Okay. Now, this as you increase the chip size now 16 percent every year and you reduce the size of the transistor 0.7 into 0.7 that is half of it, obviously the number of transistor will increase because you are increasing the size and you are in reducing the size of the transistor. So, obviously number of transistor will keep on increasing every year when the new chip will be appearing. Now, the question came till 70s or 80s early 80s the designers used to say I want to put such a large system it will require a 10 million transistor or 8 million transistor, but your technology cannot give so many transistor on chip. By 2000 or even 1995 the reverse has happened. There are number of transistors available can be as high as 800 millions or a billion transistors, but there are no system which can actually implement all of them in one chip. So, now the designers have more problem than the technology because designers do not know what to actually I should put. They started putting 4 processor on chip. So, that oh I have now quad. Okay, but actually one processor is anyway what you are using on the same chip you put 4. So, 4 times, but even then the number of transistors available is much larger than most designers can even think. This is a good micrograph of Intel 4044. If you see how complex it looks, okay, these are uh, if you see these are the pads, okay. you can see from here there are around 14 pads on a 4004 computer uh, microprocessor. Uh, by the way, it works, huh? I have worked on 4004. Okay. This is the current Pentium, uh, then it started in 80s, ends of 80s Pentium 2 which is now it looks much more component density than what uh, my, this earlier 4004 had. Of course, please remember this everyone ask us in IIT at least I know why we are still teaching 8085. In my opinion 8085 microprocessor is one of the basic microprocessor architecture and any new architecture unless you change from what uh, that architecture has it will follow same 8085 architecture in modified form and uh, keep using it unless you go from CISC to CISC to IS RISC. I do not know how changes can be made. Otherwise, there is a standard procedure of actually executing data and as long as that happens 8085 remains our workhorse. However, we to improve the speed, to improve the functionality of the uh, microprocessor improvements were made and the one of the major improvement is now coming is availability of large amount of cash on chip and we will show you this letter. So, this is Pentium 2, this is what all of you are working right now on your desktops in Pentium 4 microprocessor 2 gigahertz and now of course, 3.4 gigahertz and soon it will be 4.8 gigahertz. So, the kind of you can see from here any structure which is looks blackish 
because they are identical, these are actually cache. Okay. And uh, now one believes that there will be a huge cache area on the microprocessor rather than the controller part or the shift register part or ALU part. The major decision of doing things will rest on how much cache we have and how fast we can take data out of cache and put to processor and back to cache. So, this kind of newer way of doing faster analysis will come and that is the only improvement one expects in coming years. Uh, last slide for day, these are typical commercial memories. Uh, we have a 70 MB Intel SRAM which is my on the left this half up here and half down. Then this is Samsung's 2 GB DRAM. Of course, they, I have a uh, photograph of 4 GB, but I think this was better. So, I put I have 2 GB photograph. Uh, you can see this is this is 2 GB DRAM. So, if I can put 2 GB, 2 GB, 2 GB, 2 GB, you can see there is a 9, 18 GB DRAM and then I, if I even I put 2, then I can actually improve the speed because I can share the work and then we will call DDRAMs. Okay. Uh, it is essentially same, it is a fast DRAMs as the word went, but essentially say dual DRAM and because of that the speed improves. So, the idea is now to parallel so many DRAMs and may create sooner or later 64 GB DRAM itself. The another memory which is very, very dominantly used by most logic systems or electronic system uses what we call as a NAND ROMs. ROMs does not require power ons for retaining a data, whereas DRAMs, SRAM do require power. So, this was a another area where much of the research went through and uh, uh, 8 GB NAND ROM is what is now marketed and people believe that sooner, of course, their speed is not as close to SRAM, but closer to DRAMs. So, maybe they will first replace DRAM may replace SRAM and DRAMs will be replaced by NAND ROMs uh, sooner, SRAM may not remain or SRAM will never be called SRAM, but will be called RAMs alone. Okay. So, uh, coming back to this slide again. So, the, at the end of the day, I must tell you that uh, whatever, manif uh, whatever can be manufactured is only can be done. The manufacturers only look for profits because after all they are invested money and uh, any system to be manufactured, they first should actually find out that this system is going to be in what larger product, what is the window of that product in which it is going to be marketed and if what is the performance that system requires from your com, uh, IC chip and if you cannot produce within that window time probably your whole product will not be of any consequence. And therefore, uh, whatever people keep saying in design is a very good design. I always say there is nothing called very good design. Any design which can go into a system and gives money to the manufacturer is the best design. Thank you very much for the day. We will come back on the next time and continue with this remainder part and also give you the more details about the course and my other colleagues. Thank you for the day.